Good evening, folks, and uh, welcome to the Rutland Town Select Board meeting here on December 6th. This is our regular Select Board meeting, and if you will join me in the pledge, we'll start our meeting. Thank you and welcome again. We have a full board seated here and Joe Donato joins us on the Zoom call. Howard Burgess also joins us, as does John Balfagnant, Larry Delvenieri. I think we have, I don't see, Chris Clark is here as well. And Barbara Noyce pulling. Those are the town officials that will join us this evening as well. Um, the orders are here. You have those, Sharon. They've been signed by the rest of the board. The next order of business is the approval of the select board minutes. The first set of minutes is our regular meeting. Move we approve. November 22nd. Motion has been made to approve. Second. Seconded. Are there any additions, corrections, deletions, or changes to the minutes of November 22nd? There are none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 I abstain. Thank you, Joe. And any opposed? Hearing none. <laughs> uh, most minutes are approved. I will circulate them for signature. The next minutes we have in front of us are the minutes of the special budget meeting of November 28, 2022. Move we approve as printed. Motion's been made to approve the minutes of November 28th as printed. Second. And seconded. Are there any additions or corrections, deletions to the minutes of the 28th? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstain. Joe abstains and the minutes are approved. I will circulate those. I bring my own. Okay. <laughs> Save some water. <laughs> Because it's a long way back to your desk. It is. Yeah. Do any of the board members have any announcements this evening? Bert, Sharon? Sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Joe, again, welcome back. Um, Thank you. Hope you're feeling a little bit better and each day even more so, but I, I really appreciate you joining us this evening. Um, this is the opportunity that we have for people who are not on the agenda to address the board, and I see two distinguished guests in the room this evening. Well, I see a lot of distinguished guests, but uh, Paul Clifford and... Uh, Tom Burdett, two of our three town representatives representing our district along with others. And if you folks would like to join us right here up at the testimony table, 
formally welcome you to the meeting and I will let the two of you fight it out as to who is the senior to start your introduction. Representative, Representative elect Clifford, I believe, is going to go thank first. You. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to come here before you all tonight uh, for a couple of things. Just to one, number one, uh, I am the new representative for uh, just a newly district four. As you all know, this uh, split into two now. So I want to say thank you to the uh, to the voters in that district for their support. And also going forward, uh, I wanted to just say if there's anyone that in that district that has concerns, anything, you know, I being being the newbie. Uh, but if there's anything that I can do, uh, if you have any concerns and want to get a hold of me and that goes for the board as well. And for any, you know, uh, you know, administrators uh, also, if they get a hold of me, I'll do what I can to help you out. Thank you, Paul. Great. Thank you. And, and uh, my name is Tom Burdett. I'm your uh, one of your new representatives uh, here in Rutland Town. And uh, um, I, I know some people uh, weren't happy, you know, with the, the town being split up as far as the district went. But one thing that you can be assured is that myself, Paul and Art Peterson will work together and and I, I know for myself, and I, I'm gonna I think speak for Paul a little bit maybe that if if there's an issue in Paul's district that I can help with in Rutland Town, I'm certainly you know going to jump into it and and, uh, and do what I can. And and I'm I'm gonna guess that Paul would probably jump into the other district, um, you know that Art and I have. Um, you're gonna have uh, instead of uh, one representative for Rutland Town, you're gonna have three that will definitely work together. Um, and again, I, to repeat what Paul said, I, I, I want to thank you, you know, you folks for having us and thank the, uh, you know, the, the voters of Rutland Town um, for the, the support they gave me and, and hopefully give them the same support. And um, one thing that I wanted to bring up tonight real quick, and I know you want me to be quick, but uh, we had a meeting last night in, in the city or yesterday afternoon around ARPA money. There's a lot of ARPA money that's uh, becoming available to uh, that is available to the state of Vermont. And the governor's administration uh, did a little tour of the state yesterday and went to, I think it was three counties they right. went to. Right. They went to three different counties that uh, ARPA money is underutilized. And Rutland County is one of those counties. And I have actually talked to uh, uh, Chair Chaffee about this, um, where there's there's money available. There was there was ten or eleven either commissioners, secretaries, or deputy commissioners at this meeting uh, yesterday, and and they they want the the counties that are underutilizing this money to to use it. <clears throat> and there was uh, you know there's money for ag there. There's money for commerce. There's money for uh, uh, emergency management type things. There's mm -hmm. money for charging stations. Um, so there's, yeah. and maybe you can add a couple more, but there's there's a lot of money involved. And the contact person is not only us, but uh, I, I would recommend to go through Lyle Jepson um, mm -hmm. down, I still call it the chamber. <laughs> and uh, um, he even requested yesterday if anybody has questions and needs more information on it to, to contact him. So, Thank you, Tom. And uh, we will be, uh, all, I'm going to have Bill uh, set up a meeting uh, as soon as possible with Lyle here and and go over the parameters of the application process and what's available and so forth and i'm going to bring that back to the board and and we're we're going to jump on this because we have yeah. we will have a shovel ready project with our public safety building uh, at least and maybe right. others uh, but you can count on us to uh try to take the underutilized word away from that sure sure and another one that just came to mind is the secretary of libraries was there so there's money available for libraries also was randall smathers at the meeting uh -huh. he was good good okay there was a lot of people yeah the room was full it was packed i was yeah. impressed with the they had to keep bringing chairs in they yeah. they had chairs set up they, they brought a, another bundle of chairs at like three or four times. They had to keep bringing chairs right. and there were so many people there. Yeah. Well, when you talk to me, I figured you could do, do us the justice of uh, representing our interests there. So, you know, I didn't, 
I didn't get an invitation, yep. so I didn't I didn't go. I, I don't know how the process was for getting invitations out, but I, I'm, I'm going to stop in and see the, the uh, town manager in West Rutland. I'm going to contact. Well, I'll talk with Art Peterson since he's from Clarendon and um, have him probably contact uh, the people down in Clarendon. And be, between the two of us, we'll um, get down to Wallingford and, and let them know what's Good. going on. Any board members have any comments or questions of the representatives? Um, no, but just when you set up the meeting, Lyle, if I'm available, I'd like to come to we'll, it. We'll, I'll put it out. I'll put it out. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, Don, can you take comments from other people? Yes, uh, anyone. If you're on the call, then you're part of this meeting. So, I would just suggest that we we take a look at uh, these ARPA funds in connection with the county dispatch system that we're struggling to get off the ground. That's of primary importance to everybody in the county and ARPA funds spent on first responders benefits all taxpayers, whether they be a year old or 60 years old. So I'd ask you representatives to get your heads together and see what you can do to get some of that ARPA money for our dispatch efforts that are ongoing in the county. Okay. And yeah, there was there was a gentleman who I don't know from emergency management there yesterday who was he didn't speak specifically to to that but uh, he did say there was money available so yeah right yeah. in that regard yeah well I'm speaking to work, specifically to that that's a real yeah. that's an urgent county need we have first agree, responders right. out there we have first responders out there without adequate protection from dispatch we need to get going on this. I agree. Yeah, and that yeah. that would go through the emergency management um, and and DPS, the Department of Public Safety. In that regard, if you should see Bob Schlatt, no, you can you can get you can use ARPA funds. You don't have to go through any formal proceeding. The county itself could, or the town could apply for these funds. We we're applying right. the ARPA funds the town received to this project. So don't put it off to an agency. I'm asking you guys to get your boots on the ground with it. Very good. Okay. There is a positive suggestion. <laughs> I guess you've got your mission. Yep. It involves money, and that's yep. right. Typically, what we would like to see from. Yeah, I, I'd like to underscore that because we're in the process of budgeting now, and we don't know when we're going to get hit with the cost of dispatching for our fire and police, and we hope it's not in fiscal year twenty three twenty four. But we don't know. And we have received, you know, estimates of how much it's going to cost. Um, and then things go quiet. And then we hear again, we're supposed to do something. Things go quiet. We really need to know what our cost is going to be. And we need to know how to budget for it. And right now we're in the dark. Thank you very much. All Thank right, you. Great. Gentlemen. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, and you're welcome. And anyone that's giving reports, you're certainly welcome to leave at any time. You don't have to stay for a full, usually on, uh, well, I don't want to say that. <laughs> business as usual. Uh, next on our agenda, with the board's permission, I would like to, uh, uh, if you see under new business, we have uh, Andrew Simons is here from AM Peich with the uh, our draft town audit, and uh, I'd like to, out of courtesy, invite him. Um, and then next would be Gail Gantic, who, who will join us uh, virtually on the Zoom call. So, Andrew, if you'd like to come and join us at table here, <laughs> welcome. Thank you. <laughs> This is our annual professional audit, which is done each and every year, has been for some time by AM Pice. So the floor is yours, Andrew. All right. I want to thank the board for having me here tonight. As Don mentioned, I'm here to present the draft audit report. We are nearing the conclusion of the audit itself. And once we receive approval from management and the board, we'll issue the audit report. So hopefully each of you have five draft reports in front of you. They include the audit report, the management representation letter, governance letter, management letter, and internal control letter. 
Uh, we're only going to focus on one of the reports tonight. It's the draft audit report. It is the largest of the reports. But I do invite the board to review the other four draft reports and contact me at the office if you have any questions or concerns. Just a quick reminder, I mentioned this each year, the town does operate on the modified cash basis of accounting. This is considered a special purpose framework. It is different than the full accrual basis. This is why when we look at the financial statements, you are not gonna see receivables, payables, fixed assets, or long-term debt. And it's because we're on the modified cash basis. Another real quick reminder, we are independent of the town. And just remind the board, we are not part of the town's internal control structure. We do review internal controls, but we're not part of the structure. So I'm gonna jump into um, audit adjustments. We did have six audit adjustments. They are not material. I'll give a quick real, a real quick rundown of what they include. Uh, capital improvement expense was posted directly to fund balance. Preserve and restore funds that were received were booked directly to fund balance. Two of the adjustments related to the fiduciary investment accounts adjusting the June activity. There was one adjustment for the ARPA cash account and booking missing interest income. And the last adjustment we had had to do with settlement funds received and the expenses paid and just moving those to the correct spots. Again, six audit adjustments, we consider that good. And the overall balance that was adjusted was immaterial. We did have one report reclass for the report. This has to do with what's called GASB 84. This was implemented last year and it moves the school property taxes that are paid to the state of Vermont and to the school district from the general fund to the fiduciary fund. It gets reported as a custodial fund going forward. So now that that's out of the way, we'll jump into the actual audit report. The audit does cover a period of July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2022. We're gonna look at pages one through three real quickly. This is the independent auditor's report. This is the most important piece of the audit. It's where we provide our audit opinion. So a couple quick things with this report. The format in wording has changed from last year. We implemented what's called SAS 134 through 140. It moved our audit opinion from the end of the report to the beginning of the report since it's the most important piece. The other changes in this uh, pages one through three, it expands the wording regarding management's responsibilities and our responsibilities as the external financial statement auditors. So I am happy to inform the board we did issue an unqualified or a clean opinion. This is the same opinion that we issued in the prior year. And again, with the report, I'm not gonna go over every single aspect of it. I'm gonna go over some of the highlights that changed or anything that I feel is important. If the board goes through the report and has questions, again, I do welcome a phone call or, or an email anytime. Page four and five, these are your government-wide financial statements. They do combine your governmental activities and your business type activities, which is your water and sewer fund. They don't provide a great level of detail in my opinion, so we're actually going to ignore page four and five and move to page six. This starts your fund basis financial statements. So the first one we're looking at is your governmental funds. So based on our audit, we had determined your major funds that have to be broken out separately as your general fund, the ARPA fund, and the non-major governmental funds. <clears throat> Excuse me. The last column, non-major governmental funds, it does include your depreciation funds and the... Um, runs the Center Rollin Fire Station bond fund, which has a small amount left over. All right, so a couple things in the balance sheet, which is page six, overall cash balance at 4.9 million. It has increased about a million over last year. Did wanna point that out. One of the big contributing factors to this is the 606,000 that's been received to date for the ARPA funds. And you will notice down in the ARPA column that this has been restricted for the public safety building. 
The other part that helped increase this by the million dollars is a surplus that we have in the general fund. And we will be talking about that surplus here shortly. A couple other quick items. The cash on the very top where you see a million dollars, we have reduced. So this is your opening, ca uh, opening cash balance. Uh, this was approved by the voters and we have reduced it from 1.5 million to 1 million. That 500,000 has been moved per the voters down to long-term debt repayment and has been therefore restricted as included in your restricted cash fund. So now we'll move down to fund balances, which is on the lower part of your statement. And I'm just gonna highlight a couple of fund balances that have changed significantly from last year. So the first one will move our, from our top to bottom, general highway. Uh, this fund balance did decrease about 267,000 from last year and that was expected. Uh, the paving projects during fiscal year 21 were put on hold due to COVID and the economic uncertainty surrounding that. And those projects were combined with the projects completed in fiscal year 22 and therefore our expenses were up reducing that fund balance. The general capital improvements fund balance has increased approximately 674,000. A lot of this has to do with any surpluses that we have in the general fund. The voters have approved to sweep those uh, surpluses over to this general capital improvement fund and to restrict those funds for future use. So we will talk about budget to actual shortly, but a main contributing factor here is the local options tax, which came in approximately 400,000 over budget. And that helped to increase this general capital improvement account. One thing to note here, about 700,000 of this fund balance, the 1.5 million that we're looking at, has been earmarked for the public safety building construction costs. So that will decrease going forward as we break ground with the building. The other item I just want to mention quickly is the long-term debt repayment. As I mentioned previously, we did move 500,000 from opening cash balance to this restricted fund balance. So we did see a net increase of 365,000 in this fund balance. So we have a 500,000 transfer from opening cash and the long-term debt repayment of approximately 135,000 in fiscal year 22, changing that fund balance. Uh, I have no concerns regarding the balance sheet. Um, so we'll move on to page seven. I actually want to step back one, for one second. So looking at the general capital improvement fund balance. So we are at 1.5. I did mention we're going to use about 700,000 of that. One thing I think we should start to look at down the road is developing a capital improvement plan out one, five, 10 years possibly trying to determine what we deem to be a sufficient fund balance in this account. What we can do from there is once we reach that threshold, we can then go to the voters and ask to have these surpluses applied to another source or another opportunity for the town. So that is a potential. So I did want to mention that to the board. So we're going to move on to page seven. Page seven is your income statement, records your revenues and your expenditures, Again, not a lot of concern here. We're gonna speak more to the budget to actual on the next page. So a couple of items here I just wanna mention, we do have surpluses across the board. So if you look towards the bottom, it has excess of revenues over expenditures. So we had a surplus, net surplus, 271,000 general fund. We had a surplus in the ARPA fund of 606,000. Again, that has been restricted for the public safety building. And in the non-major governmental funds, which a reminder, those are your depreciation funds, we had a surplus of 136,000. And again, those are restricted for future asset purchases uh, for fire, police, highway, and recreation. So the overall surplus this year is a million dollars. And again, that ties back to your balance sheet cash increase of cash increase of a million dollars. I do want to move on to page eight. This is your budget to actual statement. This is an important statement that we look at every year as part of the audit. 
And what I'm going to do is highlight some of the variances and it provides some explanation for those variances as we look down that right hand column. So the first one has to do with property taxes. We will see that we do have a favorable variance from budget to actual, so actual came in higher. That is mainly due to the delinquent property taxes that were collected during the fiscal year. Delinquent property taxes did come in over budget, which is good. And that did result in the increase that you're seeing here. Just one item to mention, the net property taxes, these do exclude the payments that are collected on behalf of the school district in the state as those are moved to the fiduciary fund. So we'll see those in a minute. Collector's fees and interest, we do have a favorable variance there, positive variance. Again, this line item has to do with your del uh, delinquent tax collector's fees or taxes that he collects and the fees and interest associated with that. So again, delinquent taxes collected were over budget. And so therefore we would have expected to see this line, on, line item over budget as well, because they are tied. Another large variance that we'll take a look at is local options tax. As I mentioned previously, we are over budget by about 400,000. I did know during the last audit, we were over budget by about 203,000. So this fluctuates. This is a very hard item to budget for. We don't know how much we're going to collect each year. It has gone up each year during COVID. So it is a line item that we should take a hard look at and potentially increase the budget going forward. It is something we could possibly contact the state and possibly get some additional information too while building, building the budget. The other item that I looked at was the other this is a grouping of multiple different accounts. There was not one account that really attributed to the overall increase. It was multiple accounts. And I'll just mention a few of those to provide some explanation. So we have a, a favorable bud, a variance of 104,000. So a couple items attributing to that is the settlement funds that the town received the 30,000. We have rest restore and preserve funds from the state of Vermont. That's 13,000, not a budgeted item. We had a, an insurance reimbursement for a highway chipper. That was not a budgetable item. And vault time and copies was not a budgeted item, but came in actual revenue of about $8,000. So again, these are items or an opportunity to look at the budget going forward. These are accounts that we've identified that had the biggest budget to actual variances. And it's an opportunity to look at the future budget and build in additional budgeted revenue for the budget. Quickly going down through the expenditures, uh, the largest items that we see is public works. We have expenditures are over budget, 347,000. This ties back to the balance sheet that we referenced earlier. This has to do with the paving projects that were put on hold during fiscal year 21 combining those projects in fiscal year 22 and making that larger payment. So again, this was expected and it did come out of the restricted fund balance. The last item I wanna mention on here is debt service. We do not budget for that. Again, we have set aside a restricted fund balance to utilize to make those payments so that we're not having to charge the town taxpayers uh, additional property taxes. And that's why you see a large budget to actual variance there. Before I move on, that's, you know, those three pages are really the, the bulk of the reports, the most important pieces of the financial statements. Again, as I mentioned, you know, as we do the audit, I did not have any concerns. We would certainly relay that to the board or to management. I did mention that the audit adjustments that we have proposed are immaterial to the overall financial statements, so that is good. So before I move on, does anybody have any questions or concerns about the financial statements we've looked at? Okay, so the rest report will move pretty quick. There's not a lot in there to look at, so I'll just quickly give you a quick overview and we go from there. Uh, the next three pages, these are your proprietary funds. These are your water and sewer funds. Again, modified cash basis, so not a lot of activity. Page nine is your balance sheet. That is your assets, which is cash, and your unrestricted uh, equity. 
Page 10 is your income statements. Majority of your revenue is O&M fees collected uh, from the water and sewer users. Your expenses um, are for engineering construction costs, professional legal. It's so really not a lot of activity that goes on in here. Uh, we did have a surplus this year, 79,000, <clears> which did increase your cash balance and the equity balance. And then on page 11 is your statement of cash flows and there's really no concerns in that statement. So we'll bypass that. Page 12 and 13, these are what's called your fiduciary funds and it's the last of the financial statements. These have to do with the um, cemetery accounts. There are two investment accounts. And also there is a custodial fund. As I mentioned previously, GASB 84 forced us to move the education property taxes collected and the payments remitted to this custodial fund. It's an in and an out. So on page 12, you will see in the custodial fund column, the education property taxes received by the town and the amounts remitted to the state and to the school district. Um, I do have to apologize. I do have a correction on page 13. It should say realized gain on investments, not realized loss on investments. So that will be corrected on the final report. Again, not a lot of activity. Um, as you'll see in the trust funds, not a lot of revenue or expenses related to those accounts. So not, not a lot of concern at this point in time. I'll quickly move on to the footnotes, pages 14 through 27. Could I ask a quick question? Yes. Um, this is back to page 12. Yes. Um, the held in trust for fire. I think that's the Sutton Fund. Is it, it is. And we can only use the interest on that. And it's for purposes not otherwise covering something that the town would have to cover. This is really for the firefighters. It is correct. And I believe, yes, you cannot touch the principal portion. It's the interest that is earned on it that can be utilized for those purposes. Do we take the interest out or do we leave it there, roll it over, and then it also becomes encumbered? I'll have to take a double look at that and I will get back to you and report to the board on that. Okay. I don't have an answer off the top of my head. Thanks. So Mary, get yeah. uh, I have a, a little interest in the past. What was done was what the interest went into a, I believe it was a money market checking account and a certain portion went back to principal, a certain portion went to a money market checking account <laughs> and then the firefighters could approve um, the use of that money for the purchase or the repair of firefighting equipment. I believe that's how the uh, will is um, written. Yes, so it's at are. the discretion of the firefighters how they spend that money. In the past, um, they, the fire department has approved using that money to purchase um, rescue equipment and different things to um, kind of help along with the town to improve their ability to do those things without a tax burden to the taxpayers. Yes, I believe he is correct. I'll double check that in our notes that we have from our permanent file, but I'm quite certain that. Yeah, I, I guess, Joe, my, what I would prefer to see is that the money, the interest come out every year and not go back into principal and then get all tied up again. But yeah, the, just, it was just the, I guess the, you know, and that, that would be something that is, this is, this account is kind of a tricky one because how it's managed is by the firemen themselves and they decide which. And so when it was initially started about, you know, it was around 2002, I think this started. Um, they thought that we should try to keep increasing the principles so that there would be a bigger pool so you would generate more interest. But um, your, either way would be good at, and, and that would be something they would, I think they would have to be approached as to how they want to do it. But um, that, that was the way it was set up. And <clears throat> Andrew, in addition on that page, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned the, uh, the income and the outgo of, uh, of the educational funds in that custodial fund account. Yes. It's all blank on my sheet. So it doesn't show anything going in or out. 
Oh. Are you on page 12? Yes. So go to the next page. That's your balance sheet. So it's an in and out. So no actual asset or equity account. Okay. On page 13 on the custodial fund shows the revenue of 8.8 .8 million coming into okay. the town. And then 469,000 going to the state treasury and then 8.3 to the um, school district treasury. Okay. So in, in essence, it nets to zero. So nothing ends up on the balance sheet on the previous. Number. Okay. I guess I was, I was on the wrong page when you were. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's a GASB requirement. So all towns were required to implement that GASB um, to move it to that fund. So we can't even get any interest on that before we like transfer. Not the town's funds. Similar to the other fiduciary funds, technically they're not the town's funds. You still manage, you know, what's going on, do the accounting, so right. we report them. But no, it's a lot of it's out of your control. Uh, so the remainder of the report footnotes, page 14 through 27. Uh, because you're on modified cash basis of accounting, it does tend to eliminate a lot of the accounting pronouncements. So it really simplifies your footnotes and it keeps them relatively the same each year. So I'm really not gonna go over too much in the footnotes other than just point out like I do every year on page 21. Uh, page 21, note five, this is your long-term debt. Again, the long-term debt does not show up on your balance sheet because we're modified cash. But at the end of June 30th, 2022, we still had a little over a million dollars on the Center Alton Fire Station. And I just think it's good to always review this footnote and just remind ourselves of the obligations that the town does have, because uh, they do exist. And we got to make sure that we have the sufficient funds in order to pay this. So again, we did move over 500000 That should cover the next few fiscal years of payments on this bond. And then we'll have to determine from that point forward how to handle those payments. I do want to apologize. There's a couple misspellings on page 21, the bottom paragraph. Those two items will be corrected on the final report. And then we move to page 27, which is actually the last page of the report. Um, the only subsequent event that I'll just bring up real quickly, it's, it is the ARPA. Uh, we're all aware of the ARPA money. Uh, the town had received 615000 by June 30th. We are expected to collect another 615000 during this fiscal year. And I believe to date we have already collected 216000 of those funds. Um, I could be incorrect on that amount, but I think that is what has been collected. So again, I do want to thank Carrie and Susan for all their help throughout the audit process. They make it a very efficient um, audit for us. I do want to thank the board for your time um, and commitment to, to the auditing process. And I definitely welcome any questions or concerns, or if any questions or concerns come up, please do call me or email me. I, I would like you to... Uh to explain so that we have it on the record uh, from our management meeting. Uh, the There are three classes of restricted funds and we were talking about how we would, how we would designate the uh, special patrol funds that were received uh, and, and what the board process would be on that from a financial accountability point of view. Correct. So I'm going to focus on the definitions for fund basis financials versus the government wide. There's different for both. So for the fund basis, and it is included in the footnotes, and I will just go there for brief reference, but for fund basis, you have what's considered restricted. Page you on. Ah, uh, yes, I'm looking for that. Right. Okay, here we go. So on page 18 and 19, we do have to define in the footnotes what the restrictions are, the level restrictions, and what creates those restrictions. So starting on page 18, towards the bottom of that page called fund equity, and then it starts with restricted fund balance, the very last paragraph. So that does describe what creates a restriction. It is usually by external creditors, grantors, contributors, laws, or regulations, or also imposed by the town voters. So when a town voters vote on March, they can legally restrict uh, certain fund items, which we have taken care of in the report. The next one is a committed fund balance. This is normally committed at the select board level through a, a warrant meeting. An assigned fund balance, 
this can be done by a senior department head. They can assign fund balances. And then we're left with an unassigned fund balance. So what we're trying to do is avoid unassigned fund balances because those can tend to grow quite quickly and get out of control. So we want to make sure that we're assigning, committing, or restricting these funds and put them to the best uses that we can, can do. So those are the different levels. It, so the ultimate um, where we place it depends on the restriction put on either by voters, the board, or department head. When time-wise would that be uh, affected if, it, if, you, if we brought it to the select board level uh, by yes. June 30th? Yes, if you want to, yes, you'd want to set those restrictions before the end of the fiscal year so that we are capturing that correctly in the audit report. So it is essential to be monitoring the fund balances. We do meet with Carrie um, and we'll assist with that process. But if you have a balance that has been received and we want to do something with it, instead of sweeping it over to the capital improvements, we do want to make that decision before June 30th and have it approved at the board level and documented in the minutes. That way we're aware of it when we audit it because we do read the board minutes. And then when we discuss it with the board, we'll ensure that we correctly <laughs> handled it. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the board? Joe? Um, I have uh, two questions for Andrew. Um, regard One is regarding um, the highway budget that we're currently operating in. And <clears throat> When that budget was set up, Andrew, last year, um, we came up with a figure, one million and some thousand dollars for the budget. And inadvertently, the state aid was not deducted from that uh, total budget amount. And the amount to be raised by taxes was the entire budget. Um, normally, the state aid amount, approximately 120000 is deducted, and that money goes into highway from the state, uh, I believe, in quarterly payments. And it, is, it, is, it isn't earmarked for anything um, specific. It, it just offsets the operation of the town's highway. Um, we inadvertently did not deduct that 120000 So, in essence, the current budget was funded 100% through taxes, and there will be 120,000 coming to the town, approximately whatever the state is aid is. It'll be more or less, but it, that amount we'll use. Um, what can we? How can we spend that money um, in the projected 23-24 budget, the budget we're working on? Uh, I was hoping that we would be able to reduce the um, current or the budget we're working on by that amount and and thereby use it to offset say paving say if we only put in 200,000 for paving in the new budget and then we had that other money I, I don't know how to um, spend that because the highway budget is the one budget that you have carry over from year to year but uh, because of that um, just difference that we didn't do. We, we will have this extra money and would we be able to use that for a specific project in the budget we're now formulating and thereby reduce the amount to be raised by taxes by that amount um, that we have in excess in the current budget and it would, would that work? That would be my uh, first question. I believe you can. I would want to do a little research before I give a definitive answer on that, because I think it's important enough to double check. Um, I'm okay. quite certain that you could use it for the following fiscal year to, like you said, reduce having to raise property to taxes for a certain item. Um, so, Joe, I will definitely look into that, and I will get back to you and the board on that answer. Okay. Um, my my second question is, is we have this dilemma with the dispatch um for county dispatch and we don't know what's going to happen and this has been kicked around at the board level i did miss a couple of the board meetings when they did work on the general um budget but 
um, we have had some preliminary amounts from 150 to maybe 175,000 for the cost of dispatch for fire and police. If we um, put a sum of money for dispatch services into our general fund budget, and it would be specifically, and it does not, we find out that in the fiscal 23-24 budget that these funds are not going to be needed because they haven't got it off the ground and state dispatch is still um, taking care of us. Is there a way that those funds could be uh, utilized in the next fiscal year or when this happens and not be swept into the uh, capital improvement fund because that, that would just not be in the town's best interest. We, we have to protect ourselves to be ready to fund the dispatch services should that come to fruition um, starting July of next year, as there's some thoughts that it will be, but um, I, I just don't know what the proper procedure is and how to fund that and um, not lose it into capital improvement, but have it available. So how we would do that, you know, and make it um, available when we need it. Thank you. Yes, that's that's an area that we'd want to keep track of. So if we do include it in the budget and does not occur, we want to know that before the end of the fiscal year so that the board can commit that fund balance and not have it swept over to that capital improvements account. So we do have options. Um, again, it's just making sure that we track it and monitor it, know that it exists. Because again, we don't come in until after the fiscal year. So that'd be on Carrie and Susan to track and to make sure that we, then the board approves committing it before June 30th. Well, we kind of have the card a little before the horse, because as Joe said, and as uh, John Paul said previously, I mean, we haven't been given the proper guidance from the state in order to be able to even conduct our budget process properly. Right. And it's irresponsible to put an amount that big that busts a budget. I mean, we have to justify to the taxpayers if we raise the budget by one hundred and fifty thousand dollars on on what uh, right. we haven't received any edict or mandate to, that we have to do dispatch this way. We're waiting. We were those decisions were supposed to be made by sometime in December at, at the state level. Uh, and they and we were told to wait and stop planning for dispatch until we receive guidance from the state. Okay. So, you know, as far as budgeting, well, I don't know. Do you have a recommendation? I mean, you, we just, you don't just put money in without, I mean, knowing that it's needed. Correct. You don't. Um, I don't have an answer for you right away. Have you reached out to VLCT at all and see if they had any suggestions on how to deal with this problem? Because I assume this is more than just... Yeah, it would be more than it would be other towns similarly Correct. situated. So I, there would I think be a, we should do that. Worth a phone call to the VLCT and see what has been discussed amongst other towns, and see if there is a good answer at this point in time. I do not have an answer for the board right now on how it should be dealt with because you're correct. You really should not raise the property taxes without knowing that expenditure. So, yeah. um. Well, okay. Uh, we could discuss that further, but it's not, it wouldn't be productive, really. We got to, we have to hear an answer from the state. Correct. But I would definitely reach out to VLCT and see what other towns have been discussing regarding that matter. Yep. I think it's the best option to start with. Any other questions from board members? So... Thank you very much, Andrew. Right. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Andrew. Good to see everybody. Thank you. As usual, a, a very professional job. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Joe. Our next report, and uh, I would invite uh, I would invite our lister to the table, and uh, our, our head lister Howard Burgess is on the uh, on the Zoom call, and thank you for your patience, Gail. Gail Gantick joins us. Uh, on the Zoom call, and uh, and this is because she had intended to uh, 
she had intended to be here, but unfortunately, her husband contracted COVID and tested positive this morning. So that might not be. I Gail just... decided in the abundance of caution to join us on Zoom. Welcome, Gail, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for having me. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, very good. I appreciate you all giving me the chance to be part of your meeting tonight. Um, I'm here to discuss uh, business personal property um, and also to present uh, a proposal uh, for the town of Rutland. And um, I'm welcoming any questions as I go through uh, a little bit of what we've been doing here for the town, um, that is G&K Associates. So just to give you a little background of who I am, because I don't think a lot of us know each other. Um, my name is Gail Gantick. I own and operate a business personal property revaluation company out of the state of Connecticut. I'm also a certified appraiser there. Um, we are recognized um, 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 by the Office of Policy and Management. Um, we have to have 50 uh, credited hours of education um, to keep this uh, certification that we have. I started in this field back in 1981. That's a long time ago. I worked uh, for a large revaluation company and I traveled pretty much in the Northeast uh, just appraising business personal property. So I've worked in the state of Vermont, Connecticut, uh, state of Maine, and Massachusetts, and also in Rhode Island, where all of these states, you should know, assess business personal property uh, for local taxation. And so a lot of this experience that I have is obviously over spread over 40 years now. In 19, I guess it was about in 1991, uh, an associate of mine, a colleague, uh, we formed g and Associates. So since 1991, I have operated this company by g and &K. And we were doing revaluation work for several municipalities across New England. And at that time, uh, a lot of these, as you know, are mandated. They were on 10-year revaluations some are on five-year revaluations, which means the state or the town, I should say, or city, had to come up with a certain amount of money uh, within that time frame to conduct a state, uh, a town-wide revaluation of, the, of business personal property. So, depending on your town, obviously, you could this could run into quite a bit of money. Um, in 1998. Uh, your town came up for a revaluation. And at that time, uh, Howard Burgess is the person that contacted G&K Associates. And that's how we got to be part of this personal property appraisal work we are doing now for the town of Rutland. And Howard Burgess saw that we there was a need to do a town-wide appraisal at that time. We were invited up to go over, you know, have a meeting, go over this. And it was also at that time that we recommended that the town consider going to a fair market value appraisal approach to business personal property. And I should explain that to you a little bit. In the state of Vermont, uh, the method of depreciation and for reporting <laughs> assets is based on two methods. Uh, what's on the books for the state of Vermont is uh, people have the right to send in their fixed asset schedules and report their personal property. And they can choose method one, where it stays at 50% of that original investment or method two, which they are allowed to report the net book value of the asset and if it's fully depreciated, it stays at a 10% residual. And after our re recommendation, uh, Howard Burgess recognized that we should implement the fair market value for personal property, 
which means that the floor is, you know, it's depreciated at a floor of 30%. It's not allowed to go down past to a net book value of like 10 or 5% of the original cost, which obviously means you're maintaining a revenue um, there for the asset that is still being used at the business. So not to get too far into this, because I'm sure there's going to be questions. Um, I wanted to make sure that you understood that the town of Rutland has been assessing business personal property market value like they do for real estate. So that is one of the things that we implemented when we started back in 1998. We did the full uh, reappraisal of personal property. And ever since then, I've been invited back to do the maintenance contract that you all know about where I come up every year and I do so many new accounts every year. And we also maintain the processing and the reviewing of all of the personal property um, that you have in the town of Rutland. And this is a yearly maintenance that we do for the town. Is there any questions at this point? Okay. So one of the things that you have before you, uh, Marsha, I just wanted to ask, does the board have a copy of the letter that is sent out? To yes, the, uh, they do, Gail. Yeah, I put it on there, on their desk. You'll notice this is the one that has the town seal at the top. Right. And each member has it, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Joe, I'm sorry, you don't have one in front of you, but... Uh, So I thought we should start with this. Um, I'm not sure if a lot of you know this, but the board will know this, but what happens when you're involved with personal property? A lot of the owners of the businesses are not aware that there is a tax on business personal property. So one of the things we put together, and Marsha was instrumental in helping us reform this letter, and she actually mails this out to all the taxpayers that you currently have on the tax rolls for personal okay. property. So right now, I believe we have 218 accounts. Does that sound right, Marsha? Yeah, I think so, Gail. Yeah. We have 218 accounts. So every year they get this letter. And I just wanted to go over this a little bit because if we go over the letter, you'll understand a little bit about why I'm proposing what I am for the for the budget to consider this year. Um, the personal property form is, is based on the April 1st lien date. So in other words, everyone that owns and operates a business and has invested in property as of April 1st of every year is supposed to be reporting this equipment to you. So as of April 1st of 2022, they were supposed to report all of the assets that they have at the business. So this would be assets purchased in 2022 and any assets that they own in the business that could be five, 10 or 15 years old. It is a, they are supposed to report everything that they own. And this form is due by April 20th. We give them a deadline and they're supposed to file this to you by April 20th of every year. Now, you all know that this is a kind of the honor role, right? This is the honor policy. You send this out in good faith and you hope that this form is returned to you. And we also provide the, the statute on this form so that people understand that this is a law. This is not a choice. There is a law in the books and people are supposed to be filing this to you. So the definition of personal property is kind of hard for people to understand, but it's written here. It's under Title 32. It's in the middle of this letter that you all have. And it basically states that property of a depreciable nature used or held for use in trade, professional practice, business transaction, activity or occupation conducted for profit including without limitation, all furniture, fixtures, apparatus, tools, implements, books, machines, boats, construction devices, 
and all property used or intended to be used for production, processing, fabrications, assembling, handling, or transportation of anything of value. Now that's, that is the definition. And, you know, most people reading that a lot of times just need a little help understanding what does that mean? But basically it means that everything that they own, all the furniture, all the equipment that they use to conduct business is supposed to be declared on that form. So we have outlined that and we also, on the second page, we let people know that if they don't send the form back, then they also are forfeiting their right to appeal to an estimate that happens. You know, we are responsible. The Lister's office is responsible for valuing all the property. And what gets challenging here for any Lister's office is how do you come up with the values for, you know, estimating? So when you have people that don't estimate um, or don't send in this form, I should say, excuse me, you have to estimate it. You have to come up with a value for similar properties. So this is the letter that goes out to all the businesses. And I have we have a lot of people that send it back and we probably have a lot of people that just sort of ignore it and it probably gets buried on a desk somewhere. Um, and we have the form that goes out to them and you all have a copy of the business personal property form as well. Um, oh, I think I forgot to include that. My My bad. Yeah, yeah, there is there is a there is a form. It's a two page form uh, listing machinery and equipment, furniture, computers, and um, leased equipment. We have that. It's oh, you do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. okay. That's a pass. Okay, okay, good, good. Um, because I wanted to walk you through this form a little bit because this is I wanted you all to see what the business owner gets from us. So you have an understanding of how much work is involved in this. So the furniture, fixtures, and equipment section, as you see, is number one. Um, section two is the machinery section, and computers are broken down. And the reason we do it this way, um, just so you all know, is there are different depreciation tables that are used for furniture fixtures versus machinery. And I want you to look at the percent good. Do you see the column where it says 92%, um, 84, 76? That is a straight line depreciation table that we are utilizing out of the Marshall Swift evaluation books, which is a recognized uh, tool for assessors across the United States. This these uh, schedules that you see are truly 12 year life schedules. That's what we call them. But the percentage are different for furniture versus machinery. So if you see the machinery, the percents between the first year and the second year are smaller. It's spread over, it depreciates, everybody knows that machinery depreciates a little bit slower than furniture and equipment. So there, there's class codes here involved. So the furniture, fixtures, and equipment is on a schedule. Then we have a machinery schedule. And then we have computers schedule, which is on the second page, because obviously you have to recognize that computers get a shorter life. And does everybody see that? Yes. Okay. So I wanted to go over this with you because business owners, no matter if you're the largest business in Rutland or the smallest, you are required to report the year by year acquisitional costs of the equipment on this form. And then there is a cost factor, which is a trending table that we've been using since 2012, where you actually take the cost of the asset, you trend it to a cost, a replacement cost, and then you apply this depreciation table. Does everybody see that? And this is what we're doing every single year. This has to be tracked. So you also have a computerized um, program 
in the listers office that actually tracks every single asset, applies it to the schedule every year, and every year this gets depreciated a percentage every time the asset drops. So in other words, the asset that's bought in 21 actually gets more depreciation as the, the years are applied. There's also a section here for you all to see that you have leased equipment <coughs> involved with the town of Rutland as well. So everybody who has any kind of equipment, so examples like Coca-Cola, for instance, they declare all the personal <coughs> they own at all the locations. So right now we have 64 uh, leasing accounts and we have 154 business accounts. And just to put this in perspective, you have $35 million in assessment just for leasing of companies. And these are companies that report to you that have equipment located here in the town of Rutland and they have corporations, you know, outside of Rutland. And then the business accounts, we have roughly 154 accounts right now and you have an assessed value of um, 265 million. So when you put this together, the town of Rutland right now has over 300,000, 300 million, I should say, in assessment for yeah. personal property. And it's all maintained every single year by the forms that are mailed to each and individual owner. Now, having said that, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is there are businesses that move into Rutland and we're trying very hard to reach those people. And, you know, obviously you have 10 or 15 new businesses that you discover. I try to, I come up every single year to the town of Rutland. My job's to make sure I visit those businesses, uh, educate them a little bit, you know, explain to them what the responsibility is and um, filing this form um, that is a state law that is something the enlister's office has to in, in, you know, enforce and that everybody gets the form and we're treating everyone you know, equitably. So that's the purpose of um, the personal property for, for um, businesses to understand. Um, <laughs> You know, I've been doing this, as I said, about 40 years now, and I've been in it a long time. And I'm comfortable with stopping into new businesses cold, introducing myself, explaining that this is a process. This is something they need to do. Um, we ask for fixed asset schedules. Um, we ask permission to walk through the business, um, you know, make a list of the assets when we can. Um, so that we have an idea of what to do, what to base the assessments on. And so this is time consuming, um, as some of you can gather. Uh, it takes time to go through like a size of a, you know, a staples you would do differently than uh, a, maybe a hardware store. But all of the things that you see within each of the businesses, regardless if it's a dentist's office, a gas station, um, a veterinarian business, all of those assets that you see in each individual business has to be assessed. And, you know, it takes a lot of time and experience to be able to recognize what it is you're looking at, first of all, and then be able to appraise it. And that's the kind a lot of, of times, service. Go ahead, a lot yes. of times, Gail, it's just a, it's a problem simply finding out who the new business is and where they are, because if if we don't have local eyes on them, then you don't even know that they exist. Yes, that's correct. Um, so back in, you know, 1998, when we did the full blown revaluation, Ever since then, we've been trying to just come up and you're right, just visit the new, obviously concentrate on the new businesses, uh, focus on our large companies, um, track the assets year to year on these forms that are coming in. Because some of the things you need to know when the, 
when businesses are sold, um, all the figures on these forms change. And so what happens is, you know, when you get a new cost, you have to, somebody has to decide whether or not this new cost is recognized, you know, is, is obviously representing all of the assets that you had at the business location. Because sometimes the conditions of these sales are, you know, a liquidated sale. So you can't, you know, have one restaurant assessed at 100,000 and another restaurant the same size assessed at 20,000. So those are the things that, you know, ex only experience, um, you know, people in this field that have been doing it a really long time, you know, can offer a town or a city, you know, share with you, educate everybody, um, what kind of revenue it takes to put a lot of these businesses together. That's what we do. That's my specialty. That's what I'm comfortable with. You know, I can tell by looking at an assessment, whether it's understated or, you know, it's overstated, it goes both ways. And my job is to make sure that there's equity among the businesses that you have in Rutland. And that's what we've been trying to do for about 24 years now. Um, the town of Rutland has not had a full-blown revaluation since 1998. And one of the things we started to talk about, um, you know, the listers and I, Howard and Marsha, I mean, we've kind of recognized that we need to start facing the fact that, you know, we need to put something in place, implement something that works for the town of Rutland, um, something that's, you know, where you're not asked to evaluate maybe everybody in one year, because these revaluations, even for personal property, are quite expensive. I did one last year. They had approximately 200 businesses. I did it in Maine, and it was over $100,000 to do that revaluation for personal property. It was a scratch job. It means you go out to every single business make a list of the equipment that's on the premises, uh, talk to CPAs, get fixed asset schedules, um, and put together, um, you know, an itemized listing that you need to give back to a taxpayer because they have the right to look at everything before we commit the figures. And this kind of process from beginning to end cost a town and city easily over 100000 to perform. And when we were talking about this in the office, what most of the towns and cities are going to, uh, just so all of you know, is instead of doing full-blown revaluations, a big cost up front, is to start doing, you know, divide the number of accounts that you have over like a four-year period where you're doing so many a year and that after a four-year period, you've done everything. But in order to do that, we need to set aside, you know, a, a portion of what it would cost to start doing some of the current businesses you have there, as well as the new businesses you have there, so that everybody is caught up over a four-year cycle. And that's what a lot of the towns and cities have elected to do, regardless if you're in Massachusetts, or if you're in Maine, or you're in Vermont, or you're here in Connecticut, a lot of these municipalities um, are focused on doing a partial reval for personal property. And that's what this presentation, this is what this proposal is in front of you to maybe start considering something like this so that we're ahead of the game so that, you know, we can start catching all of this up so that everybody is visited. Because right now, to be honest with you, the budget that you all have right now, I'm actually doing this for $30 an account, which is, I think everybody understands at this point where we are now with the town of Rutland, that that is not enough revenue or services or, you know, I should say tools for me to do this to be more effective for you. And that's what you, what I'm here to try to answer questions or maybe go over anything I can with you um, to talk about this a little further.
questions and from I know, the board? Um, sorry, I know Marsha did some numbers for us, you know, looking at what the revenue basis was last year and then what it was this year, because we're gaining every year, you know, people are investing, they're buying new equipment. Um, last year, I have to say though, I can, you know, we talked about this, the inventory are up for people, um, things are costing more, um, but they are declaring and the revenue there is obvious. Well, Obviously, Gail, as we know, the um, utilities are um, really, really amping up. Um, you and I and uh, Christy and the people from Velco and the people from GMP, we've gone over their declarations and they're, uh, you know, they're definitely going up. They're, they're expanding. Um, 2020 to 2021, our, <clears throat> um, we had 251,570,061 in um, equipment and inventory. Last year, 2021 to 2022, it went up to 303 million, 304,176, which was an increase of over $51 million in revenue, which produced $113,194 in tax revenue to the town of Rutland. Yes. Um, well, you know, the town of Rutland, I, if you just look, just ride through what I see, you have industrials, uh, you have um, retail stores, you have small um, sole proprietors, but you also have construction. Um, you have people moving in and out of the city, all the, excuse me, the town all the time. So, you know, Marsha, you're right. And she knows this because she is the person that actually puts together all these forms for us for G and K every single year. In other words, every single declaration that comes in, she logs in, received, um, she checks off stuff. She notes, she notes things um, that are changing, uh, businesses that have sold, uh, people that are saying they're gone. Uh, we verify all of that. But you have, you know, industry, you have um, solar panels, you have cell towers, you have Velco, you have the cable company, you have, you know, cable alone and all of these other large companies who are having to do build outs to stay at, um, above the technology. But we have that even in the medical field. And a lot of the industrial areas, the manufacturing that you have are substantial. I don't think I need to say it. I think you know who you have there. You have one of the, the largest taxpayers you have there. Everyone knows who it is. It is GE. That account alone, um, honestly, has required more of my work every year. I have somebody who I work with. We spend about a week reconciling uh, the figures every year. Um, and we do that for everybody. We look at every single form that comes in. Any, any forms or any figures that are dropping in assets or have increased in assets, you know, we reconcile back. We make sure that the equipment is being reported accurately. And when you know of stuff like Marsha is the one that says to me, you know, I know Velco is putting in a grid or they're building out something in town. A lot of you know about what's happening around you. You can see it. And part of the Lister's office is to communicate with me to let me know what's going on. So to get back to what Don was commenting on, I mean, you all know who's moving in, uh, you know who's leaving, you know who's changing out, and we try to get a handle on that and make sure we're not missing it in everybody. If I can say something. Of Go course. Ahead, Howard. Yeah, I'd like to say that, you know, Gail did a, a, an excellent, outstanding job back in 1998 when she came through. And it's been 25 years, and it really is time to start going back through through these businesses and doing an update, just like we do with uh, uh, 
real estate. Every so many years, you have to go through and do it. We, it, it's really time. I mean, there's things that, have, as you know, Gail, have gone out there, gone on that we don't know about. And the only way we're going to know is if you get out and go through those buildings, you know, yourself. And, and, and I just want to say that it, I believe it's time. And it will be nice to get her started into a program with the town to start updating this. And she's the, she's the only person around that can do it. And we, well, I think we need to take advantage and, and get something going. I appreciate you saying that. Um, I, you know, I wanted to tell you, um, I enjoy what I'm doing. You have to like this kind of work. Um, there's not a lot of people that like like doing business personal property. You can find a lot of people who do the real estate, um, but I love personal property. You have to like it. I enjoy meeting people. I don't mind sharing the process with them. Um, I'm comfortable with it. I'm comfortable with business owners. I have a lot in common with them. I have the same issues they have. Um, I understand you know, what it's like to own and operate that business. I know what it's like to maintain employees. I have a lot in common with them. And I think there's a mutual respect because when you go there, you introduce yourself, you meet these people, you talk with them about the, the assets, you tell them, you explain to them how you have to list the desk. Yes, the office stuff is important. You have to list that. You have to list the equipment. You walk them through the process. I give them, I personally itemize this for them. I give a sheet back to them. They fully understand what they're being assessed on. There are not just a bunch of numbers here. There is an itemized list and Marsha can show this to you at any other time that you need to see it. Um, you know, a listing, a sampling, we can provide that to you. Um, we can't give you people's confidential information, but I can give you a sampling of what I do for people. And that way they have a chance to go over it. And a lot of these people appreciate it because they used my list to file with the town going forward. That's what they do. Okay, we have we have some other questions from, from board members, uh, Gail. So please. Mary. Yeah. Um, hi, Gail. I'm Mary Ashcroft. I've heard your name for many years. Oh, Thank hi, you for Mary. Your good work. Um, a few questions. In your proposal, you estimate approximately 218 accounts for the year that you would be looking at. Um, what's the total number, roughly, in town? That is the number. So right now, we have 54 leasing companies, Mary, and we have uh -huh. approximately 154 accounts on the ground, you know, okay. that you see. And obviously, um, we know, we, we believe there we're missing some, right? Um, so last year, um, to be perfectly honest with you, I was invited to do the revaluation for the town of Pittsburgh. And so, you know, what we started doing was, um, you know, it's ground, you go date, you go, Every day you're going out, you're driving around literally to make sure you haven't missed anybody because some people are not listed on the um, Secretary of State's website, right? So a lot of this you have to go by word of mouth, by building permits, um, motor vehicles that are registered. We know we track personal property so many different ways. You know, if somebody has six or seven trailers, then you have to assume that, you know, we might have some equipment that goes on them. Um, so we really go door to door on this. But where I'm going with this is I was up physically in Rutland, um, picking up your forms, uh, visiting uh, Marsha and Howard, uh, going into the office, and I did, I performed probably 10 or 15, right, Marsha? We picked up yeah, probably yeah. 15 or 20 accounts just driving through from Pittsburgh right. to Rutland. Okay, a, a few more questions, if I might. Um, so you, we're estimating approximately 218, give or take. Last year... Um, and and the cost for would be thirty thousand dollars. It sounds like for this kind of townwide reappraisal of 
business personal property. Correct. What was your what was your contract cost for the town last year? I just so I can compare. Oh no, that's a good question. So Mary, what we were doing was a maintenance contract um, to keep the fees down. We had agreed to do um, uh, 218 accounts at $30 an account, which came out to about $6,500. And so all I was doing was coming up and just visiting new accounts for that kind of money. 6,500, because you have to remember, I have to come up, I'm out of state, I come there for the week, or I come there for three or four days, um, I make appointments to see the new accounts only. That's what we okay. were doing. Okay. Um, and Howard, I'll ask you in a minute where this is in the budget, um, and then where we would need to, if we agree to do this, where we would put it for the coming year. But let me um, let me ask a few more questions. So if we do a $30,000 contract with you, that's more or less a one-year major review. And then after that, it would be back to maintenance contracts? No. So here's the, instead of spending, Mary, like $100,000 to do all eight, 218, what I'm proposing here is if you have 154, we would do a portion of those every year over a four year period. So in other words, I would do a walkthrough, say approximately, is that 35 accounts, something like that, of the existing accounts plus the new accounts. And then process all the other declarations, review them to make sure we have assessments on them. Okay, well, I, I'm picking up on the 218 because that's that was in your contract, and instead of saying a quarter of these accounts each each in the oh, next. Oh, I four apologize years, so. if that's not clear. Okay, that's a good point. Um, next question. Um, is there? I've I talked with Lister, um, a Lister and former select board member in another town, and. There are minimums that some towns impose below which they don't assess a personal property tax. And I'm understanding that Rutland Town doesn't have a minimum. It goes right down to zero. Do you have a recommendation on that for us? Well, we've talked about this too, haven't we, Howard and Marcia? I think it had to do mostly with the mill rate. So in other words, if the assessment was a $2,000 assessment, I think it was like 50, I, I, I don't have it in front of me, right, Marsha? But I think you brought this to my attention that the bill was like, I don't even know if it was $5, am I correct? It, correct, right. Based and on what, what we have, yeah, what we've done in the past is anything that's gonna cost us more than mailing out the the bill mm -hmm. uh we give it to our tax collector he comes into the b board of abatement and we just we abate those uh yeah. yeah i mean we're not going to send somebody a bill for 22 cents but then you know, they right? end up on the delinquent tax rolls which is just no cool. no because i i try to uh, i try to um inform jim ahead of time that you know Okay. This is only two thousand dollars based on twenty one cents per hundred. You know, we're <laughs> it just uh it, it's not worth it. Well, um, back to the back to the good. question that Mary asked, Gail, you know, if based is, on your based on the charge that you make for doing the account, wouldn't that track with how what our minimum should be? Well, well okay, so let's back up a bit because there are certain laws on the books that allow you to vote on an ordinance of some sort, I believe. The town has to make that decision that there's a threshold. You know, it, it gets a little difficult because, you know, for me, I don't know what that threshold is until I go there. Right, Mary? I don't know if it's a $2,000 account. Some could be like if you have a small business out of your home and you are a realtor or you are an attorney working out of your home, you're talking about a desk, a chair and a computer. 
most towns and cities don't use my service. You know, I let people know what's there. I make recommendations on what you should use use me for. I mean, my focus is for the more complicated and, you know, the accounts, obviously, that make sense for me to go there. But there has to be a decision about the smaller accounts. I agree. But that's really a town's decision based on your mill rates and the cost of doing it. You have to set those thresholds and you would have to vote on that as to, you know, if it's a minimum of a $500 assessment, which we have a lot of those on leasing accounts. They may have two water coolers in the town of Rutland valued at 200 bucks each. You know, that that is a perfect example of where we have accounts that are lower than $2,000 even. But, you know, I don't skip anybody. I try to make sure all of you know who's there, who's covered. Um, you know, maybe the Lister's office can do all the smaller ones. You know, I'm open to other suggestions. I mean, I'm here to share with you that in order for us to go forward, I'm recommending that we concentrate on, you know, the bigger picture, like all of the larger accounts and some of the accounts we're missing. Okay, and I, I think one more question for you, and that is, how did how did you and can you capture the work at home folks who um, during COVID went to their homes instead of going to a central office location? Now, it's a very good question. So, you know, I worked all through COVID and I had work um, because business personal property still had to be assessed. Uh, unfortunately, every assessor across the states and everybody who's involved with personal property, they still had to put grand lists together, Mary. They still had to have revaluations. They still had to do all of the things you're mentioning. I've been doing this for so long that I had no problem going out with masks if people permitted me, and they did, and or call people on the phone, go over what it is they have for business personal property. You know, after a while, after you've been doing this for 40 years, you know what the plumber needs. You pretty much understand what the um, landscaper is using. Most of these people have been very cooperative. I have never, ever had a problem working through COVID. And so we were able to reach even those people. And they even appreciated the fact that we called and that they didn't want to see us in person. You know, we did the best we could under the circumstances, right? Yeah, I guess I was more curious as to how you capture the work at home when, you know, perhaps the home office was in Ludlow and now there are three or four folks now working out of their homes in Rutland Town. And of course, that may very well have been reversed by now. Okay. Yes. I mean, we had a lot of that. So we have large insurance companies here where people were working with a small computer out of the house. But you have to remember the way the law is structured, wherever the corporate office is, that company is, re is supposed to be reporting the assets. So during COVID, a lot of assessors agreed so that we didn't have, you know, six computers being assessed at $700 that the corporate office would be responsible for still declaring them to the town that they were operating out of. Because it, we knew this was going to be a short period, right? That people were gonna go back to work and start working from the home office again. Okay, that makes sense. So if we engage you for this $30,000 contract, we can anticipate having a similar expense each of the next four years? Correct. What I'm suggesting to you all is think about it this way. Um, all of these accounts, you know, when you divide this amount of money, Mary, you're talking about an average of $137 per account. I think all of you know right now tonight, I can't do a large manufacturer for that. And I can't do, um, you know, a staples for that. And I can't, you know, all of this is different. I'm asking you to budget at least 30000 to start with so that I can start doing a walkthrough, a lot of accounts there, 
plus the new ones. That's what you're actually giving <clears throat> me the money for, or, you know, and also processing all the others we're not visiting purposely, personally, excuse me, but we still have to come up with a value for them. Okay. Thank you very much. Gail, in, in, uh, uh, in response to the, the cost factor, Howard, uh, do, do you know, Howard, whether the fund that the state establishes for reappraisal can be applied to personal property and inventory, or is that solely to be used for real estate appraisal? Well, yeah, I'm not sure, but I, I think it is. It's, I think it's only for real estate because it's it's driven on uh, the grand list uh, on all the properties in town. I, I believe it's just the for real estate. And that's I'd like to get an I'd like to get an answer from the state as to that because I, I don't I, know. I actually reached out to Christy today, posing that question to her. I haven't heard back from her. Well, that's that's a budgeting question that we if we have a if we have that as a resource that might help. But does anyone have any other questions for Gail? I know it's a lot to take in. Um, there's a lot to it. There's a lot of details that go into maintaining personal property. I know a lot of towns, I want to say cities in the state of Vermont have elected not to keep personal property on, but they're not in the same situation. Most of these towns have, you know, small cottage industry type businesses. Um, and for them, it was a different type of decision. But you have to remember the revenues that come in for a business personal property offsets the real estate tax bill, right? It real it offsets the tax amount on real estate because if you get rid of business personal property, that revenue, that amount of money that it costs for a town or city to run has to go somewhere. Right. So if you're going to keep personal property, I guess I was, you know, I just wanted you to know that I think spreading it out over four years is a lot easier for towns and cities and has been a lot easier for towns and cities to budget for. And the monies that you do pick pick up and you do have coming in, say for 2023, you know, that pays for the budget the following year. Right, right. Yeah. That's no, what I valuable. wanted you to look at. So it's not like you know, that's what I want to try to get across. It, and it's, I apologize that I couldn't be there in person um, because I'm more comfortable, obviously, in a room with all of you than this Zoom I find very distracting. But I hope I came across um, where you understand that the process is starts from the forms. People are supposed to be filling these out. A lot of them don't. So you need to reach people a different way. You need to have somebody on the ground actually going to these businesses to educate them. Well, I I agree, and and I thank you very much because this has been as educational for for me and for all of us, and that's why uh, we wanted to schedule you because you know the work of the Lister's office just you know it just seems to get done very competently over a lot of years, <laughs> Howard, and that's a compliment to you and it's a compliment to Marsha and Dean. But the board and the and the general public and our department heads and whatever have very little knowledge of what goes on in that office and how complicated it is and how involved it is. And so it's been very valuable this evening. You know, it may it may seem a little tiresome and weary, and I, I can see people's eyes kind of drooping. <laughs> well, but. it's it's a very dry subject. You know, mm -hmm. I teach a lot of classes, uh, Don. I'm invited uh, throughout the Northeast to teach the classes. Um, I've written the procedures uh, for the state of Connecticut. I was involved with writing procedures for personal property. You know, I have a lot of education behind me, a lot of resources. And I've enjoyed working in the town of Rutland. I feel, you know, very lucky to have maintained the relationship that I have with all of you. And I'm hoping to continue to do that. You know, obviously health reasons, you know, I mean, we all, I'm healthy. Um, and right now I hope that I can get you through 
maybe at least another four years to get everything back on, you know, track with um, getting everybody updated. That's my hope. Well, Gail, not only that, but you know the problems that we encounter because of our zip code. Um, you know, GE is a North Clarendon zip code. Everything goes to the town of North Clarendon. Right. And sometimes we don't get those declarations back until it's almost the, you know, the the deadline. Yeah, uh, the we get Yeah. We get Menden, we get Rutland City. Um, Katie Lang, Lois, and I have been Barry Keefe before. We've worked together to, you know, map out what what is where. I have um, I've sent some of these bigger vendors that are leasing companies. Send them a list of the Rutland Town streets and the Rutland City streets, and hopefully next year they'll you know, pay attention to what, what I have sent them so that they get us our declarations based on the, you know, proper uh, businesses that they are supposed to be declaring. Yes, well, I, you know, and you know, Howard, boy, before there was a Marsha, um, Howard and I spent hours, not only was he responsible for the real estate, I have to say this, because a lot of the towns and cities have a designated person in their offices to help focus on the personal property. And we have that with Marsha. But there were years, right, Howard? You and I, I mean, we would be in the office late hours, 11 or 12 o'clock at night. And I'm not complaining because I'm that person. I like to make sure everything is thorough. Our job was to make sure the administrative tax side matched the personal property software package that I also provide to you to maintain all of this. So Marsha's right. There's so many pieces to this. It takes hours. And her involvement obviously makes this easier. Um, she puts all the forms together for me. Again, she makes a lot of phone calls, right, Marsha, hours uh, spending time calling these people up, letting them know that they've reported the form in the wrong jurisdiction. We need right. this, right? You go through all the streets on the leasing companies alone. Marsha spends time going through 30 or 40 pages of leasing companies, one account making sure that we do not have the city of Rutland. And we do, we have them on the list and we have to take them off so that they're not assessed in the wrong jurisdiction. It takes a lot of hours to do that. And back in the day, well, that's we, what uh, Howard was doing. I think we have more than enough information now to make a decision oh, and, okay. and uh, <laughs> that's been very informative. And I will give your contact, contact information to each of the well, they have it on the okay. on the contract, and and they're certainly welcome. My board members are certainly welcome to call you at any time and, and get any clarification that they need. Absolutely. So thank I'm you sure. again, Gail. Okay, thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Gail. Okay, okay. and wish your husband a speedy recovery, and that oh, you don't yes. get it. <laughs> yes, and then there's that. <laughs> thank you all. All right. Have a good rest of your evening. Thank you. And we can continue with our meeting with department heads. And if I can find my agenda here, more papers. Perry, thanks for your patience, or your eyes are a little bit heavy. I think we should have limits on people's presentations. Well, it's ridiculous. That's the first time she's. Been. I don't care. It's ridiculous. Maybe to you. But, um, no, it's not just me. Well, yeah. Uh, I had a bunch of stuff, but I'm only going to talk about one thing now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. Some people are understanding. Appreciate it. Right. So, good news. I found somebody that I think would be a perfect fit for my office as a third person. Um, 
and you know it's been it it's been a while and it's taken some time to, to try to find that right person um and i'd like to offer this position to this person um but i'm wondering if we could i got th- thinking about it a little bit and i've been saying about $18 an hour to people and I did some math and also the fact that um, we had somebody a couple years ago helping in our office who was making per hour more than $18 and I'm wondering if I could um, bump that up maybe $2 an hour to 20 because that would be what the previous person that was helping out in the office was making. And I'm bringing this forth because the person that I'm thinking of could be available to start at the beginning of January. And I'm thinking about beginning of January to the end of June when our fiscal year closes. Right now we have budgeted $8,000 in the office help line. Well, doing the math, if I offered her 20, which I think would be comparable because there's businesses out there that are offering 18 that. Yeah, McDonald's. Are, well, I was going to put it in a, in a nice little way that, you know. Well, it's a fact. It, yeah. it is. The, this requires a little bit more um, experience and knowledge, perhaps. And we're going to trust this person with a lot of money eventually. And uh, starting at 20, I think would be fair enough rather than 18, where you could go to a fast food place and start off at 18. I'm not saying anything wrong about that. I'm just kind of putting it out there. I doing the math, getting back to that, I would need about $2,000 $2,000 extra dollars to offer this person um, in addition to the eight grand to get us through to June 30th. But there's our, my training line that is in general that I don't touch. And there's $3,000 in there. And I don't see myself using $3,000 from now until. So June. you think you could pull that? Okay, so Carrie, sure. I have I have two questions, one for the board and one for you. Mm. You have the money to be able to do this and in the, your in your overall budget. That's where I'm going. Okay, with. that's the answer to that question. And the answer to the, the question to the board is haven't haven't we previously operated under the policy of the town that the treasurer's budget and personnel are her responsibility? And you know we we really um, yeah it's her that's her office it's, yeah it's the her higher, yeah, the the higher or fire and who she does amount of payment yeah I think you know Carrie's respecting that we oh, probably understand. had a different amount in mind um, based yeah. upon what she'd been telling us when she was recruiting folks but if right. you can't get somebody for 18 and you can for 20, I think that answers the question. Those for me, I mean. Um, my next question would be the coming fiscal year and, and yep. building the budget for yeah. that. And do we do a- I got a creative proposal. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I like these. <laughs> so why don't we start at 19 for the six month probation period. After six months is up, if they're a rock star and we want to keep them, they get a pay raise to 20 and they could know that. Or they get the 6% pay increase, which would pull them up, I think, to over 20. Yeah, you don't I'm, do math on that. And I, I hear you and I'm yeah. not saying no. I'm, um, you know, I had a correspondence between this person and she's currently making a good hourly wage at her co- current job she's just has some things where i think this would be a better fit for her and i'd hate to lose her based on on saying 19 i don't want to scare her away i've had such a tough time trying to find that right person Mm -hmm. um to to get back to next fiscal year i did just kind of 
put it out there. And um, if if we do make this a full time job for next year, I would do the minimum full time hours, which would be like thirty two hours a week. Um, and the six percent would bump the twenty dollars to twenty one twenty an hour. I think I did that right. If I didn't do it right, I was probably tired or something. <laughs> um, so the line, if, I mean, I could double check this math would be um, a little over 35,000 for next year. As opposed, as opposed to the 30 we 30. put in. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 35,276. That's what I got, Mary. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Phew. So, <laughs> so I would just like to make a comment about that. Um, we, I believe in the highway, um, the starting pay, and Dave would know this number, is more than that, isn't it, per hour, Dave? Yes, 22. Yeah, so why would we not start this person at 20 um, when we, you know, we just have a new hire in the other department, and should we as a town have a more consistent starting per hour wage so that, you know, it doesn't really, you know, it's not all over the place, you know, 18 to 22 is a pretty big spread. And Carrie, I have no problem with the uh, $20 per hour. I think that's only fair. And, you know, we just need to look at keeping things um, compatible um, with new people and, and different positions like that. Uh, the other thing I would mention is, um, for your bookkeeping purposes and doing stuff, I know we have 8,000 budgeted for extra help. I think you're better off showing a deficit in that particular line item than trying to move money from one line to the other. Um, and I think our auditors would agree with that. Um, so it, you would be better showing a $2,000 over in your hired help rather than try to take money from your training and slide it over there because that doesn't, I don't know, for me, that doesn't just track well, but that's just me. And it doesn't show a true need because I was always under the impression when I did the high, uh, fire budgets that if you showed a need, it was easier to ask the board for, or the voters for additional money for a particular line. So that, those are my thoughts on that. Thank you. I completely agree with you in your last comment, Joe. Um, and I guess also we could look at it as um, the money would be there to pay her. Um, I don't necessarily have to show it and I wouldn't show it for those purposes, Joe, in that line, but it, it, it lives there and, and it's there to offer. Her. Yeah. You just, you, you just won't overspend your, entire budget but one specific line would be and and i understand that that logic yeah, yeah that's but, but that I, point I, is well, i'm in, I'm in favor well of well taken you know, yeah starting, that point you know, is well taken in, in order to expedite things uh, and yep. for carrie's benefit in terms of the process she's been through which has been pretty long and extensive and frustrating for her I would suggest a board motion would be in order if if the board chooses to get her underway with her search. I don't search. think the board has to do that. It's Carrie's office. No, she's asking us for permission to do it. So well, she doesn't have to ask. It's the side of the board the no. that the yeah. town clerk is within her authority to offer twenty dollars an hour. Yeah, right. And then what we do for. And that, I guess, needs to be seconded. I don't know what to do for the coming year, but it looks like we're going to have to bump up no, our budget proposal. Change the budget. Just yeah. a little tweak there. Okay. We is the board is the board Sense in agreement board. with this uh, with this proposal? Yeah. If uh, that being the yep. case, then Carrie, uh, I I would say go forward. Yes. And that and that is what I choose to do. And um, I will then reach out to this person and tell her what I have to offer and see if she accepts it. And then hopefully Has any of you met her. I met her. She's no. really a nice girl. Well, that's... Sharon happened to be in the, in the building at the time, <laughs> but let me offer it to her first before I, I let 
you know how right and she does you. know that there <laughs> does she know that there's a six percent cost of living that will be attached to that i will explain everything to her and of course it's all subject to approval by the voters on town meeting days so. she does understand that yeah. we did go over those processes okay. so so i'm just going to stop there for That's tonight good. thank you <laughs> maybe maybe here, here i'll i'll end with this so if anybody ever has any questions about the new public safety building i made this wonderful new little binder for us that'll live in the vault and it has all of what we've paid out so far and what monies we've um, been uh, given and chose to use and the voters approved and where we are grabbing our money from over time. Nice. This will yeah, be well done, Perry. This will be in the vault. So okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Awesome. We never had one of those before. The, the center, uh, yes, Marie had some center Rutland ones in there, but this is a little more cumbersome. So this is its new own little binder. So you win. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Rowe has left the meeting. He left me to do his. Um, he asked me if I would do recreation. Oh, okay, good. So, because his leg was starting to. Bother. Our recreation committee chairman, uh, Sharon Garapano Russell, will give the recreation report. Okay. Mike said um, that. He will be shooting off a schedule for basketball to you, Bill. Yep. Okay. And his second thing was that um, the skating rink will be up and freezing when we get the proper weather. <laughs> <laughs> and other than that, that was all he had to offer. Very good. Thank you, Mike. And we did go over Thanks, Mike. um, Mike's budget and his budget is almost i mean he's really kept it right up to the line so he's done a good job good thank you mike and our next re any questions our next report will be from barbara pulling our planning commission chair person good evening and hi, hi. i'll abbreviate things too um because of the, the, the earlier speakers. Uh, we're working on um, an MOU with GMP for the pocket park, um, which will eventually, you know, send to the town attorney. But we're working on, you know, what, what kind of things we want in that uh, agreement, as well as figuring out um, phases for po the pocket park construction. And right now I'm looking at three different stages um, and um, would like to work with the, the town planning commission a little bit more and we'll meet Thursday night. Um, but in short, it would be, um, you know, we have a North and a South end and a middle part that we could call. Um, so the South end, um, might be a good place to start because that's where the falls is. And, and that's where a lot of the public amenities would be the, the picnic tables and the overlooks and, and those things. But like I said, I'd like to run it by the um, town planning commission on Thursday night. And um, I should have uh, more for you the next meeting. And to follow up on what the, the legislators were talking about yesterday, there were a lot of agencies uh, state agencies in Rutland, and um, one of them was the um, the building services, the Department of Building Services, and it started with ARP, ARPA money, but then they had to switch. They couldn't use ARPA money, but it is uh, a pretty amazing um, new program for municipalities. It's um, it's called the Municipal Energy Resilience Program, and there will be uh, free assessments for um, anyone that applies, that those will mostly, those will be walkthroughs, um, energy conservation assessments. There will be up to, um, towns could apply for up to $500,000 in grants, no local match. And those projects could be for weatherization, 
um, more efficiency in the buildings or replacing fossil fuel heating systems. They're just getting this program off the ground. Uh, still a lot of questions, um, still a lot of things for that department to figure out, um, but it is going to. It is an exciting prospect um, for the town. And uh, the Regional Planning Commission will have part of that. VLCT will have part of, of administering it. And um, we may want to get a group, maybe the Energy Committee, or, or whoever you would suggest together to just take take a look at what we have for municipal buildings and what might be some some projects that would be worth pursuing. I like that idea a lot. Five hundred thousand, no match. I like that even better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's forty five million dollars total for this program. Um, wow, for any municipality around the state. Now, Barbara, is that just just in this energy part of the program? There's 35 million. There's 45 million. Yes, just in this this new energy resilience program. Yep. Well, I think I think your suggestion is well taken. I think the energy committee chairperson would be happy to do that. So, okay, you're tasked. <laughs> you want me to stop in Thursday? Um, yeah, you can. We can uh, talk on the phone ahead of time. Okay. If you want as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Thanks. All right. That's Thank it. Barb. Thanks, Barb. Thank you, Barb. Have a nice Thanks. evening. Okay. Thanks for your patience. Okay. Yep. Our next report will be from Chris Clark, our town fire chief. Chris, good evening. Good evening. Uh, just one thing tonight. Uh, hopefully it's all in your, on your desk. Uh, a month or two ago, I missed the meeting. Dale brought some bylaw changes to you, and you guys suggested uh, SOPs and SOGs. However, we feel these uh, eight things really need to be bylaws, not SOGs. So I was hoping you could uh, approve them tonight. Okay. Uh, members have these on your desk. Have you seen them? Uh... Does anyone have any questions or suggestions or comments about these additions to the Rutland Town bylaws, Rutland Town firefighter bylaws, I guess? Um, typo in 4.19. All members are required to don. Should not be D-A-W-N, it should be D-O-N. <laughs> and I'll tell I'm Billy. Just, <laughs> I, I could mention it to him. He, you know, um, and then just why why the bylaws? I, and I'll respect the decision and and I'll I'll approve. You know, vote to approve it. But I'm curious to know why why you wanted to go up the next level to to bylaws. Uh, the department felt that these are things that need to be followed, and we figured we. We uh, all agreed that the bylaws are just, you know, the rock of this department and SOGs can be questionable once in a while. And everybody felt these were not questionable items. Fair enough. So I'll, okay. I'll, uh, I, would, I would move we approve these proposed additions. Second. Motion's been made and seconded to approve the additions to the Rutland Town. Now, uh, uh, just a question on the title, uh, Chris. It says to Rutland Town Bylaws. What is the Rutland Town Fire Department Bylaws, right? It is yeah. for the fire department. These are bylaws yeah. of the department. Correct. Okay. So if we if you'd change that to make sure that it says Rutland Town Fire Department. These aren't that title won't we can do that. <laughs> Oh, it doesn't? Oh, oh okay. So yeah. So the motion's been made and seconded. Is there any other any other comments other than the correction of the uh, spelling in 4.19? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And it's unanimous, and the bylaws have been approved. All right. Thank you. 
That's all I had for Chris. Tonight. <laughs> Chris, yeah. you, you had a question for me the other day about the new fire truck. Are you, are you still questioning that or? Um, for the parade, you mean? Mm -hmm. Um, I asked for volunteers the other night. I haven't got any uh, definite answers yet, so I don't know if we're attending or not quite yet. Okay. And so, it, well, where does that go? Where, does it go throughout other towns? What does it do? Uh, from what I was told, it starts in West Rutland, goes through Proctor, from Proctor down Route 7 to the bypass, over the bypass, and back to West Rutland. From what I was told, I haven't That's seen any waste parade. Yeah, the Cassell Waste Parade. I saw a flyer for it today. What is it? It starts in West Rutland. It starts in West Rutland at Cassell Waste. Okay. And goes all the way up through Proctor to Pittsford, all the way down through Rutland and back up over the bypass. So who's involved? Anybody, Anybody that wants to show up, essentially. Is the highway department going to do it? Considering it, if we can find somebody who wants to do it. Yeah, it's an awkward yeah, it's I was thinking about maybe putting one of my I trucks correct? in it if I had time. What? I was thinking about maybe putting one of my trucks in it if I had time. Okay. I don't, okay. It's kind of open free for all. For it's just anybody. a festive thing with the decorated trucks and Fabian decorates one. Uh, Ed has asked uh, uh, It just takes time and sometimes around Christmas it's hard to find volunteers and Right. You know, is what yeah, it is. That was the concern. No, he's a, he's asked Jim to, to do to uh, decorate the uh, his police vehicle with the canine because they like to have canine. No, no, I'm it. still talking about the fire department. Oh, yeah. I mean, if Chris, don't kill yourself if you can't find volunteers. I mean, it is what it is. Hmm. Yeah. No, I get that. Twenty yeah, third is two days before Christmas. So yeah. yeah. I'll keep you posted. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Is that it, Chris? That's all I have. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Have a nice evening. You too. Our next report will be from Dave Sears, who's here, our town road commissioner. Evening, Dave. Hello. As they once told me, the five B's. Be brief, brother, be brief. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Uh, we spent most of the last couple of weeks working on the shared use path. <clears throat> uh, excuse me. Um, so we went out and kind of, it was all laid out with the center line. We went out and marked the eight foot wide. And there was two stakes up against trees and we totally missed them. And we just couldn't figure this dumb thing out. <laughs> and it took us two days to finally find these other two stakes. So on Thursday, I believe it's Thursday, um, Robert Clark is coming up and we're just going to go over it one time, make sure because those two stakes kind of screwed everything up. So we'll make sure everything is where it's supposed to be and we'll commence making some trees not so big. And uh, Fred came up and put his blessing on what trees so far, I need to go. He's all happy with that. Um, so that's what it is. Uh, last week, we had a little tiny storm event. Uh, we just handled it in-house. Uh, not really a big deal. We covered it. Came in at 4 in the morning, and we were done by 7.30 or something. Uh, they delivered us salt today. I've been waiting for it for two weeks. Oh. Our building now is full like the third pass through the all-you-can-eat buffet at Golden Corral. <laughs> <laughs> We had to shovel the stuff into the door to close the door. Oh, yeah. um, perfect. Yeah, it's awesome. That's a good place to be at this time. It, of is. Year. it <laughs> is, especially with place. the rail stuff they're talking about and all that. Like, yeah. I'm just good. Yeah. And uh, in my free time, I've been kind of working on the paving list for uh, next year. I got it pretty much nailed down. I'm just working on quantities and distances and all that stuff right now. So I should have that in the next week or so. And the driveway up on Quarter Line Road's in there? The driveway on Quarter Line Road is there, yeah. Thanks. Yep. Mm -hmm. Question or a suggestion back about the shared use path. Mm -hmm. 
pull the Act 250 permit amendment to make sure that you comply with whatever they say there about tree cutting or removal and all of that stuff. Just yep. so, yeah. Thank yeah, you. we've tried to try to keep that kind of to a minimum. Like, yes. You know, kind of turn like this and miss that tree kind of thing. It's yeah. trying yeah, to keep it, keep it um, as little as possible. The two adjacent owners down there by Shazana Drive, mm -hmm. just touch base with them because there's something about a fence. Yes. Yeah, there's supposed to be a fence. Yes. Yeah, it was certain heights and some stuff like that. Maybe just clarify that with them to make sure everybody's still on the same page. I think yeah, that I, was part of the easement. Right, I did make sure that we have an them, easement in hand. That Byron did with that. Yeah, there was some of that. Some, I think one person wanted some trees removed you know, while we were in the process and then a fence put back and some stuff like that. Yeah, the path kind of goes, there's a line of trees there and it kind of goes just a skew of the tree line. Over yeah. The... Yeah, good. That's what I got. Good job. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Since we're talking about shared use paths and paths, you know, I just thought I'd bring it up so that so that it can be on the record for the Peg TV program. For anyone else in the town that happens to be listening, that um, I received a complaint. Well, it, it was it was a suggestion, which I relayed to Mike Rowe, our, our recreation director, that uh, a regular dog walker at the park has noticed that since we don't have as many maintenance workers up there mowing lawns and out and about <coughs> to be visible, uh, the dog, dog do has appeared in quite the quantities on the shared use path. To the point where the individuals have to do a lot of zigzagging, not to avoid the trees, but to avoid the other stuff. And I just want to remind our users, uh, both town and anyone else that's using it, because it's it's open to the public. If your dog poops, scoop. Yeah, that's the, we provide bags, and Mike has trouble keeping them stocked because people take more than just what they need. They've been <laughs> they've been stealing them, but. We try to keep up with it. Uh, we provide re mm -hmm. no, we we provide receptacles as well. Yes. And if you're going to use the park to walk your dog, you are responsible for picking up the waste. And if it doesn't improve or it gets worse, we have in the past threatened to close the walking trails to the park. And when that was done, it improved. We don't feel that we should have to do that. So please be respectful and take charge of your dog and all of his stuff and put it away where it belongs. Do you notice he said he? So it must be the female dogs are much better. They are. Yeah. They're very much better. Behaved. Yeah. Our next committee report <laughs> to save me from any more embarrassment here is Ed Dumas, our town police chief. Good evening, Ed. Thanks for your patience. Wow. I don't have much either. So, yeah. for the last week's mm -hmm. yeah, 51 calls for service, uh, and we had 21 traffic stops. Did Ted give you this this page here? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Yeah. That's not. I don't think oh, I that's okay. one. Last have you notice at the top of that just the most page. page? Is that in the report or last page on the report? Last page. Last page of those. Well, we gotta find the report. report or... <laughs> if you notice on the top of it, the uh where it says 2019 up to 2022, you go across that's the complaints that uh, we started our diligence uh in October. It's consistently it's going down yeah. and down south in the town. The trends we see, I see right now is that if we're not down there, now it's happening during the day. So we'll have to, we'll have to switch things up here at some point in time. But we're pretty busy during the course of the day. Okay. That's about all I have at this point. In time. And that information that our town attorney requested has been forwarded to him. He has did that. that night. And no, I didn't have the report in front of me, but are, 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 
are we down in calls? To, you you were looking at trends for the. Uh, yeah, I, I'm just going about the last, the last uh, couple months. We started the end of October, end of September, and October we did hit pretty heavy down there, and then November we're down another ten calls, and uh, well, December's not there yet. So, I like to see we haven't seen that few calls since January of uh, 2022. It's not going to change as long as they keep having we have we help people down there, uh, the homeless population. It's just just the way it is at this point in time. I would say most of these thefts are drug related. People are strung out on on drugs. I have a something on. I visited for a few minutes with Chief Dumas and um um. Lynette, sorry. Yep. And the they impressed upon me something that we missed when we were doing the personnel policy. And that is the disciplinary section that we set out that applies to all town employees. We actually need to amend that because police right. is governed by state statute for their disciplinary process. So I don't know if it's stat statute, but it's a statewide policy. It's yeah, and I, I think there are I think there are provisions of statute in yes. there because JP used to quote them to me. So yes. um so it, um my suggestion would be that we maybe you folks know some language, but um that we have Bill maybe get in touch with the town attorney and come up with language to exempt the police department or the, the people, the, the serving officers from the personnel disciplinary policy um, because they have their own policy in yep. state state law. Yep. So, yep. yeah, and get it done and, and yep. then it's over with it. Yep. Is that? Any questions? Is that okay? So we can have Bill pursue that? You bet. The town attorney? I, okay. I, yeah. I pointed yep. in that direction and I got a nod. So I think he's <laughs> flag or something over there. Okay. Any, any more, Ed? I yeah, we did. We uh, just, just so you know that we, we did receive notification uh, through various sources that there was a state meeting last week. And at the state meeting, the uh, Cortina Inn, owners were told at that meeting that their their vouchers would cease in March as we have agreed to and would be transferred across the street to the day's end. Correct. <laughs> and Correct. our attorney is yeah. working on that. Our attorney is has that as the top of his list <laughs> right now. And hopefully we, we'll have an answer or some litigation and Possibly our negotiating committee will be on another mission, Sharon. <laughs> um, well, we have set a precedent, so you know, I don't, I don't have any doubt that we will be asking them for some support and cooperation for law enforcement on that side. Of course, now we're worried. At least they got run across the road to steal. Well, stuff. that's we're worried about now deaths. What are we dealing with deaths? People yes. across deaths the on the uh, on the roadways, uh, crossing that traffic in order to get to Dick's to make those wonderful purchases. So nobody uh, gets easy better than God. Anyways, I just thought I'd let to inform the public that <laughs> the problem continues, and we continue to try to find solutions to the problem. Well, you know when you're you're in the pit with. Pit snakes, that's what you get. Sorry, but that's my feeling. We haven't had any honesty come out of there. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. I'm looking to see. I don't see. I don't see Mike. Mike could be on duty. Okay, Mike got all of me. I'm sorry. He's got nothing to add at this point in time. Uh, he had a you know, boiler issue and his other job, so he's unable to make the meeting. He has nothing to add. Uh, I would like to just go back. Quick, quick. 
I just would say that Mike and uh, JP are doing a great job. JP and traffic and Mike down at the at the uh, the mall, the Green Mountain Plaza. Also, the this last two week period, the fire department was. I had I've had I think six accidents, two two entrapments in one night in the same few hours in the middle of a rainstorm. And those guys came out and flipped cars over and helped the lady get out of the car and another one down here. So the fire department was, uh, I can't say enough good about them. They're, they're right there. I don't have to worry about them blocking up the whole road. They take care of all the issues there. I can just work, worry about what I got to do. And it's a uh, fantastic work with those guys. I was Christmas shopping again down at the Green Mountain Plaza and I had my jacket on. So two of the, supervisors in two different stores just said, you know, you guys have done a great job with your police. I said, no, Ed Dumas and our police have done a good job. They said it's made a difference. I, one other thing. So also we, we checked the numbers on the, the other parts of the town. So we've increased our patrols at the Green Plaza. So the thefts at Home Depot like quadrupled in that same time period. Uh, they are in the process of hiring a loss prevention person. I understand they've got a lot of takers. So I'm looking forward to working with that. Whoever that next person is, it should be, uh, we'll have to work with them a little more closely and try to alleviate this problem. Or at least... Yeah, what was it? Home Depot, some um, people shopping there stopped the... <laughs> that would be the person that uh, Ted Washburn uh, arrested or tried to arrest at the uh, tractor supply. Did the affidavit he was on on the lamb for probably two weeks and then he decided to steal some more you know, state troopers uh arrived there and were able to uh save him from his uh the people who held him for him <laughs> <laughs> it was we were able to with ted's paperwork there to lodge him he's currently still in jail <clears throat> that would be mr tim shaw who's a major problem in uh in Rolland county at this point in time I think has been for a long time. I wonder, it, it could be a correlation, but I think our our uh, Cali converters thefts we haven't had any <laughs> since he uh, he uh, went to jail. Could be wrong, but could be just I, a coincidence. I, huh? It could be just a coincidence, uh, but <laughs> no. that, and that's all I have. Do you do you have now? Did I miss? Do do you have some stats on the special patrols, the hours, and the funds? And if you don't, could you have that like? Uh, on a sheet so you can see that. Yeah, I know. I know uh, Lynn and Gary are working on that all the time, trying to keep it up to date. Okay. Um, well, how many hours and all that well, I'd like to know, you know, how yep. many hours and then translated to how much, how much funding and then what yep. funding is left. So we get a balance in that particular account. Okay. Yep. Yes. Thank you very much, Ed. Thanks again. Thanks, Ed. And, uh, so that takes care of our first constable report. And next up is John Paul Fignan, our town health officer, public safety building clerk, and second constable, JP. Welcome and thanks for your patience. Hey, good evening. Um, I can cut right to the chase. I had previously forwarded the board reports from uh, Ed Clark and Patrick as to where we are. Since forwarding those reports to you, we have been able to coordinate the door issues into the electrical drawings, so we've eliminated a couple of the items there. The uh, holdup right now, we're just waiting on the structural engineer, and they've predicted that they can get their work done by uh, December 4th, so this week. And uh, shortly thereafter that, we're going to have a final meeting to make sure that we've done all the crossing of the T's and the I's and should be able to put it out to bid in January. Hmm. On the uh, health officer aspect, not much to report. Dog bites, cat bites, that type of thing. Although I did get a complaint I'll be looking into tomorrow morning from the Comfort Inn. But other than that, it's been kind of quiet. <clears throat> the door issue, yeah. is was that the locks issue on the doors, JP? Correct. There was an issue of security locks on the doors, Ed, that you've got to... Comfort Inn? No. Oh, oh, you're talking about the, the Comfort Inn? No. No, no, no. No, talking no I'm the talking building. about the public safety building. The, 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 is that the, was that the issue? You said the door issue was done? Right. 
Ted got together with the uh, security people and they all sat down and, and um, they answered any questions that they had. Okay. Good. And that's all I have for you. So it looks like the first of January, first week of January, yep. out to bed. Yep. December 4th. Now, um, in those documents that I forwarded to you, it's important that we get the architectural contract up to the town attorney um, yeah. just so he can put his eyes on it. It's a standard AIA contract. It's what the, um, this firm has used. But I, I do think it's important that we take that step and get that up to them um, as soon as possible. Um, the architect calls our attention specifically to Section 11 of one of the forms, and that has to do with bonding information and insurance that I know the board will want guidance on those issues. Uh, where is the contract? When will it be in whose hands and who will get it to the attorney? So the contract was forwarded to uh, everybody this morning, and I assume you or Bill or someone from the select board will get it up to Kevin. Do you have it? Yes, I, I sent don't... it to all of you. Can you resend JP so nobody seems to have gotten it? Well, I got something, but I didn't read through it all. Would you send it to Bill, I guess? And Bill yeah. needs to get it to um, Kevin. Sure. That's the way it should happen. I, Thank you. Sure. I, I can do that as soon as we're done here. Okay. Great. Good. Good. So that it gets to him quickly. Right. Uh, Thank you, JP. Okay, thank you. Have a good night. You too. too. And next up is Bill Sweet, our town administrator. Evening, Bill. Good evening. All right. A couple things left in the packet. And uh, so we covered A and B in the packet. Both of those are all set. Uh, the next thing is C, which is a updated draft of our streets and sidewalk ordinance. Uh, if you go through it, you'll see there's a few changes. Um, not not a lot. Um, a lot of it was just grammar updates, things like that. Uh, we did update the culvert sizes. So there was some inconsistencies in the sizes of culverts that are needed. Uh, so Dave took a hold of this, uh, went through and updated everything. Uh, and that is represented in the copies that you have. Um, this is also, so this, this ordinance is also important because I don't think Barbara's on anymore. But uh, this ordinance is actually referenced in the subdivision ordinance. So when a subdivision is created, which has a new, which has streets or things being developed or, or driveways, it references this document. So this actually is important when it comes to the subdivision process as well. Uh, so we're, we're, Joe has, uh, Dave did talk to Joe and Joe gave his blessing on it. Uh, so this updates the new layout, the new format. Uh, and, um, the only real change is the size of the culverts in it and the grammar. So um, we're presenting it to you all to see if you'll give it your blessing so we can move forward with the... I did a quick skim through, I think, and maybe I got it wrong, but what we really wanted to make sure is that the state standards apply. Mm -hmm. And I see that on page three, you have an attachment a and and say also see Vermont standards B seventy one. I suggest we do it a little more strongly than that and just say are to be constructed per Vermont standards B seventy one, and and then C attached. You know, but I would they got to meet Vermont standards or we don't take the road. Yeah. So that yeah. So the B seventy one standard is for residential and commercial driveways. Okay. And that's that's the addendum. That's the very last page of the. Yeah. So of where's the reference then to 
the state standards. Now, if you tell me it's supposed to be in the subdivision ordinance and nope, you're working on that, it's that's not. fine. It, the, the, this, the, the construction standards are not in the subdivision ordinance. Subdivision ordinance references this document. Okay, so we got to make it really clear. Okay, so we could add an attachment B, which is the which is the rest of the standard. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how you'd like to word that. So I, I understand what I, you're saying. I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah. So I think maybe just if we can put it aside for two weeks okay, and see where we can make it clear that this is, we're going to follow state standards here. Okay. Yeah. I want to look into the culvert size thing too, because I've been told some month by some other people that the state's starting to push to 18 inch culverts. Okay. Roadways or for driveway accesses. I know I've, I've had to, I actually one road commissioner in a certain town made me rip out a 15 inch brand new and put 18 in that 15 in it. No, okay. I, I don't know if the state's so trying to push bigger. If probably. if I can get feedback from, from anybody, anybody that would like it before the next meeting, I can. Yeah, the rest of it looks fine. Okay. And I think front and center, we have to reference the Vermont state standards. Okay. And whatever that, what we used to call it, what the orange book. Yes. That probably that is less formal and we probably should call it what it really is and just make it clear right off the top, even if yeah. you had to add something in the beginning. Okay. Is that in, cha in case they change the color? Of yes, because you never know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You good with that? No problem. You good with Bill. that? Okay. The rest we'll of it have... looks fine. I mean, it's just grammar. Yeah, it was a, a largely it was grammar. So that was just the other thing. So, so we'll that's... have that and that'll be... Yep. Front and center on the next agenda. No problem. Uh, the the rest of the packet was uh, all budget related. So there's a few things in here that you were that you got that I wanted I wanted just to show you real quick. Uh, the salary. There's two sheets for salary rates. Mm -hmm. One is the current year. <clears throat> that should have, should have been the first one. Uh, so that's July 1, 22 to June 30. And then, so we gave you that one. And then the next one is what it would be with the 6% raises included. So it's just a straight update. Uh, there were some, I did, I did change some of the titles like patrol officer, full-time one, full-time two, just how, so it lines up. So it's easier to follow um, like the listers we added separately uh, so we, we kind of broke it out just to kind of make it easier to to follow. But so the, you have the two salary salary sheets for for that. <clears throat> um, so is the in the select board line? Are the clerk and others swapped? Nope, that's how it is right now. Really, really. So the clerk gets paid less. No, th th there was a mistake there. I I brought that to your attention, Bill. I don't know how it got in there, but that's not what's in the town report. That's that's how I got. That's how this was given to me. So <clears throat> I don't. I don't. All right. Well, just, we should check. Well, that. just notice that. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll change. <laughs> hey, who wants to be clerk? <laughs> hey, I know it goes <laughs> for others. Um, <laughs> so if, if, like, if you want to give me give me if you want to update it, so we can give me notes with the updates, we'll be happy to change it. So okay. I, well, I just yeah, I just didn't have that. So I. I the, Okay. I, I I had given this to to Carrie to help have her update it, so she went back and that's what she had. So that's what we that's what we. Well, there went needs with, to so. be another update too, and that's down on transfer station manager. We talked about that. That's uh, right. That's on there for twenty three fifty nine. It, it is because you have because there was we hadn't changed it yet. Right. So as of as of when this was printed, this is what it was. So that's why. Right. I. I so I know there's I know there are changes coming, mm -hmm. but I'm trying to either be like we're going to do all the changes or incorporate it as as we go with versions okay. because well, it I gets just harder to do a markup so you yep. know which ones. So we change. should include these with all of our budget papers. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So to to your to to that point uh Don on the July 123 the transfer station manager line reflects the 6% over the 25. Okay, so because I know in it's effect, coming, you've actually incorporated the we've twenty-five. Been, we've included that because we know it's coming. Okay, but that's that's this is still theoretical. Okay, well, where the the other fine. one is is actual. That's fine. It's okay, uh, there is a sheet that has first constable, second constable on it. Uh, I had I talked with JP and and gotten some gotten some information from him. So the top of it there is their salary so the first two lines is the first constable salary second constable salary 
Uh, and then the middle section there shows what the hourly rate was and the number of hours that goes into that rate. That makes sense. Yeah, because I had the five fifty hours somewhere. Yeah, so there it is. So, so that's that's Mike's is the five fifty. JP's is the five fifty with with the two hundred additional hours for gates and miscellaneous other tasks. And so he gets this to the seven fifty. Okay. And then the the bottom one is the calculation that they have for their vehicles, which is at the five fifty hours. Five hundred fifty hours, okay. right? At sixteen dollars an hour plus some miscellaneous. That's how, that's how they got to that number. Okay. So this is just a, 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 how, a, how we got their number. Good. Uh, Good. Then the next thing was just the total budgets. Um, I, uh, I received all, but the, but the fire budget so far. So that's, that's everything is, is there and you have copies of it everything that of I got. We worked. That's right. I worked with it with Chris and Dell. Okay. On the fire budget. That's fine. I just it just hadn't made it made its way to me yet, so um, that's fine. Uh, but you have everything else is there, and uh, Mary, you're asking before about the listers line. Yes, it's if you go to the last full page of the general budget, that's the appraisal update line fifty six thirty. So this this reflects that cost. Okay, where I've got the last full page. Yep. Almost yeah. to the bottom. 5630. 5630. Okay, so what's the well, I was looking at the last page, which was the, okay. So just so that goes from 65 as she had talked about up to 30, which yes. is the proposed number she gave us. And the other thing we we had each of the budget sheets had had various numbers at the bottom of them, it's like here's an increase or a decrease, but it never actually said what it was for. So if you notice, like the last page of the general budget sheet, now we have at the bottom there the net change year over year. Um, so that's each each budget has that noted at the bottom of it now, just for your for your reference. You think we got the numbers right? Should be right. All right. And then um, the other thing was the old business item was the informational building permit. I don't know if we wanted to do anything with that. Um, <laughs> Dave, Dave, uh, Dave and I met um, as kind of kind of related to this. Dave and I met Green Mountain Power, some of their guys up at the uh, pipeline today off Sanborn Place. They are uh, they just sent us plans this afternoon. They're going to be replacing a very large section of it uh, from Sanborn either direction. Uh, so that's going to be, that's going out to bid right now. Uh, but they brought us up there because there's a lot of trees that are going to have to come out. Just they're going to have to come out. It's on uh, their property. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. They, they have, they have an easement there. Uh, but we'll get the complaints from the walkers. Yeah. Dave, Dave is going to take care of, of getting Fred involved. Okay. Um, but he, they, they've got plans there when it's restored, it's going to be seeded and grass that, and there's a path from Grover drive mm -hmm. over that. They're yes. going to fix that. So it's better alignment. So. Uh, but he said this is one of the oldest sections of it, and it's from like what do you say, 1918. So it's wow. it's time probably. Yeah. Um, so they're ready for that. But uh, while when we were up there, uh, when we were up there, we uh, we pulled up and um, there was a brand new garage under construction. And I'm like, hmm, mm -hmm. look at that. Mm -hmm. So um, I sent a letter to the property owner, and it says, please send us our your your permit. So. Um, other than, oh, there's a highway committee meeting Friday morning. I sent out the email just a little while ago. Um, they, that's uh, just to cover a couple things. Um, but uh, that should be easy. I think we're going to try and we may actually go over some of the ordinance. Then if we want, we can do that. We can do that Friday morning. Uh, we can go over the street sidewalk ordinance and, and, and get some of the references. And there's a couple other ones, other ordinances we want to do. If, if there's time, we'll, we'll get to those. But uh I think that's everything I have. It is everything I have. Any questions for Bill? Joey, all set? I am. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Very good. You're welcome. Any meeting updates? Schedule committee meetings while we've got a budget meeting. 
that would be next Monday. Monday. Next Monday. <laughs> yes. Yeah, six o'clock. Is that, is that fine with everybody? This is uh, this good. will be our final. Are we gonna need an extra hour? Pardon me? Yeah, are we gonna need an extra hour? So we should we try to start at five? Well, it's the final. No, one. I mean, you haven't seen three of them yet. So yeah, yeah no, that's why. Right. I know. Should we start at five to get an extra hour? I, I would just soon. Yeah. Can too. Okay. Maybe we should start at five yeah. on Monday. Seems to be a consensus for five o'clock starting time on next Monday, the 12th. And that will be our final budget meeting. Hopefully we'll put the budget to rest and to print at that meeting. Uh, Move we adjourn. Move to adjourn. Motion's made to adjourn. Undebatable. All those in favor? All right. We're done. All right.